Hello and welcome to another episode of Into the Afroverse with your host William Jones and Into the Afroverse is where we're taking black folks into the future. excited for my guest. I've been trying to have his brother on for quite some time. We were finally able to work it out and make it happen. And when you guys hear what he has to say and the work that he's been doing, you'll see why I was so excited to have him on today. Today we're joined by Dr. Lonnie A.V. Brooks. He's a professor in communication at California State University, East Bay. And he's a visiting professor at Hassel Plattner Institute for Design, Stanford University. Dr. Brooks is co-founder of the Afro Rhythm Futures Group, imagining democratized futures. As a leader and a co-designer of the game Afrofuturism, Afrofuturisms from the future, he is co-executive producer of the Afrofuturism podcast and a contributing co-author to the anthology Afrofuturism 2.0, The Rise of Astro Blackness. And with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Brooks. How you doing today, sir? Great. Oh, my God. It's finally so good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I say, we, we take some while, but hey, it's yeah. definitely worth it. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, let's get right to it, man. Uh, you have quite an extensive uh, resume, quite an extensive background, specifically in the field of Afrofuturism. What is it that attracted you to this field? And what is it that you're looking to add to it? Well, you know, um, what attracted me to this field was that I was already in future studies um, in terms of what I studied from graduate studies. Um, I have been, and I am an affiliate researcher with the Institute for the Future. And um, that's a think tank based in Palo Alto in Northern California. And, um, I had been, I'd studied them to look at the future because they do futures uh, forecasting for, you know, nonprofit firms, uh, government agencies and for-profit companies. And uh, when I was there, uh, I noticed that they didn't really talk about the future of black people. I mean, it was mostly the future of other countries, uh, the future of mainstream consumerism in the US, uh, you know, future of environment, future of health, but I just didn't see myself represented at all in most of the forecasts. Um, and only recently, you know, they've they've actually done some futures research in the Sudan, um, you know, and, and other, you know, countries like India and China. But um, <laughs> when I got the call about contributing to Afrofuturism, the rise of astro-Blackness, I saw an opportunity to combine and to connect with Ronaldo Anderson, the co-founder of the Black Speculative Arts Movement, and to really reflect on my experiences as being a minority forecaster, <laughs> in a sense, you know, right. and I had been in conversation with um, Stuart Brand, the Long Now Foundation, and Alexander Zan uh, Alexander from um, also the co-director of the Long Now Foundation until recently. And so uh, we actually did a whole project with them, introducing students to the future. But I, I was reflecting on it and I said, you know, actually, what does it mean to be a minority forecaster? And kind of asking this question to Stuart Brand and also my future's colleagues, where am I in this future? And so I wrote this essay about it. And so like, I, I was like, wow, Afrofuturism, that's where futures research meets the African and black diasporic experience and i was like yes it's like i had found my calling you know seeing some other fellow black nerds in the mix and like oh yes so given that opportunity i was like i i found my calling i found my purpose i found a place where i belong in the future's world because right now the forecasting um 
research area has been, you know, long dominated through an Eurocentric point of view. And it's expanding. And I wanted to help expand it further, open that envelope. And so Afrofuturism, in terms of seeing alternative visions from the future from the Black experience, really opened up, exploded that window. And um, I'm so glad it did. You know, Ronaldo Anderson asked me if I could create a conference for the Black Speculative Arts Movement in Oakland. And at the time, you know, I was like, you know, under the pressure of getting tenure and I was like really busy and I was like, oh my God, the last thing I want to do is organize a whole conference. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was like that reluctant moment, Moses moment. It was like, but once I did, I was like, hell yes, I'm I'm meeting all these amazing artists and 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 policymakers and technologists. And I was like, wow, I, this is this is my network. This is my people. Gotcha. Never, never look back. So uh two questions with that. When people hear futuristic studies, obviously it's about predicting the future, uh preparing for the future. What is it that you have to study? What is it you're exactly looking at that makes it the futuristic studies? What fields are you dealing with? What's that conversation like? Well, first, I would say that, you know, every every futurist in the field would say that we can't really predict the future, which is a good thing. Right. We can anticipate the future. Um, but, you know, it's not like it's completely determined, which is good because we don't want it to be determined. No. <laughs> and be able to create it and edit it. <laughs> so um, so that's in terms of what to know about it or how to study for it is kind of fine tuning. You know, like we, we are taught like to intentionally study history and the past, but not really taught about how to study the future. So I think um, having a background in history is great. Having some knowledge of technology is good too. Um, and the history of technology and even the social history of technology is really important as well. So, um, but, you know, further training, I got trained on the ground as an intern at the Institute for the Future in the late 90s. So what they taught me about was, you know, what is a signal of the future? You know, something in the present that that is interesting and could scale up in the future. You know, what's a driver? Um, you know, some type of driving technological, economic, or um, political force, or societal force, or social force. And, you know, to so to learn these terms, um, in addition, right now, like, when I was, when I was there, you know, when I first started out, there was no, like, hardly any training about the future. And now, you know, the Institute for the Future is offering courses in Foresight, even on Coursera, uh, Kedge uh, in Florida. Uh, so many institutes now of the future or think tanks are offering actual courses about um, how to study the future. So that's something I would recommend uh, too. And uh, especially on Coursera, because it's you know cheaper <laughs> and easier <Right. laughs> to <laughs> so, um, and even going to, you know, going to Black Speculative Arts Movement conferences like that or, or festivals, I call them conference festivals, really, is, is, is a way to educate yourself. And now there's like tons of, of media articles about the future. I mean, this is kind of sort of a renaissance of future studies. So you can learn not only about um, traditional future studies, like, uh, but expanded ideas through indigenous futurism, queer futurism you know, Afrofuturism. Um, so it's really, like I recommend this journal called the Journal of Future Studies. Mm -hmm. um, it's based it's based mainly through um, Australian scholars and, and, but it's a combination of, of scholars globally. Um, and it's actually published out of Taiwan. So it's really effective in educating yourself about, about future studies. Yeah, it has some really great articles. I see. Yeah. So uh, and if you're just joining us, this is Into the Afroverse with your host, William Jones, uh, where we're taking Black folks into the future. And today we're joined by uh, Dr. Brooks, and we're talking about Black folks in the future. We're talking about futuristic studies. So based on what you study, what does the future look like for Black folks? 
what's what's the good and bad that you've come across when you talk about things like you mentioned signaling and so forth what are what what do you see what do you anticipate to use your terminology in terms of the future of black folks in this country in particular well you know one thing is you know what what's needed to study the future of black people black folks is also a knowledge of black history mm. you know the black diaspora history and i'd say uh, the one effective thing that we have is that we're, we are we are the signals of the future, actually, you know, and so in, in music and in literature, um, in, in culture, uh, in art, um, in science and in innovation. So I'd say the future is, you know, we still have this tremendous wealth gap between white folks and black folks in this country. So um, I think that we can. um help to close that gap to through a movement of reparations um, that can happen in different ways. You know, we, um, my, my group, the Afro Rhythm Futures Group actually works with Google. We've played our game with Google um, and we're trying to open up the window at Google to, to further see how they could offer um, more types of benefits um, for marginalized communities um, but what was really the global majority, really, uh, in terms of accessing the cloud, like what would it be and might be to have some type of reparations through cloud access that would give you freer access at little nor co no cost, you know? So what I think, what I see for the future of Black folks is that to, that we can um, actually push for and open the envelope of voting Mm -hmm. more and vote in candidates that represent our interests. Um, you know, like Stacey Abrams and her whole movement in Georgia and, and nationally and globally. Um, I see that we need that's so the truth is we need to close the wealth gap. Um, and I see more entrepreneurial initiatives happening in the black community. Like we in Oakland have created um or are working with uh what's called the uh, black economic zone in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And it's actually um, a, a cooperative, a collaboration, a consortium of different businesses um, and nonprofits that are trying to expand this Black economic zone. And what I see is it's like almost like fulfilling the Black Panther Party promise of like a mini state, a mini, yeah, a mini, a mini city right. with Oakland. And I see that that can be replicated nationally um, to revitalize our black economic zones. And I see that as the pathway to the future. Um, and we can actually kind of, you know, how can we reduce rents in this in these cities to entice black folks to come back and live here? Because, you know, we used to be majority black in Oakland. Now we're like at 26%. So that's the bad news. Right. But the opportunity is to expand um, the black population in Oakland to revitalize the area. So I actually see um, this renaissance of black revival of 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 black economic opportunities so I, see. I see now just so we're clear and we hear this term this this economic gap wealth gap between black people and white people in this country can you speak to exactly what that gap is because i want to make sure that uh when we use these terms that you know Folks understand exactly what it is you're saying because they may have their own idea of what the wealth gap is. So could you speak a little bit to exactly what that gap is? And you gave us example uh, with the economic zone of how we can close it. Is there anything else that futurists like yourself and others are working on to help close that gap? Yes. So, um, you know, for instance, like if you take a maybe a black family at you know, say thirty to fifty thousand uh, dollars. White families are probably like double that mm -hmm. in income, let's say. And so, um, as an example, um, and there's probably more precise figures than right. that, right? But um, one of the things that we're looking at is how do we create um, not a metaverse, but a pluriverse in virtual and extended reality. And uh, that's the next frontier, actually, because um, in terms of, I work with a group called, we, the Afro Rhythms Futures Group works with a group called Origami Air, their virtual reality experience company based in San Diego at UC San Diego. And they work with the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. 
We've collaborated with them to create a town in the future called Afterville. It's on the VR chat platform now. It used to be on Altspace VR. And um, they've also given us a ship uh, that they, they launch projects in dirigibles in virtual reality. And ours is called the Air Afro-Rhythm Ship. Together with them, we're creating what we call the um, uh, uh, Astro Egalitarian Virtual Nation or Network. And it's meant to be a safe space for black, the Black diaspora and Indigenous peoples. And so what we're actually using it as, as, as a platform to, what does it take to create uh, a revitalized, safe, free, liberating space in the next frontier in virtual reality or extended reality? And we see this as a tremendous entrepreneurial initiative where we can be at the forefront and create organizations, businesses, initiatives. We can experiment with what reparations might look like in virtual reality. Um, and I think that's the next frontier. It doesn't, so with extended reality, um, and especially with the latest tools coming out, you can be present and embodied and also in virtual reality too. You can flip back and forth. So, I mean, that's the future. It's not like you're gonna be encased, you know, 24 right. seven in this darkness, right? <laughs> but that you can actually, um, kind of move in different uh, different realities, like truly have a multiverse. But we're calling it the pluriverse because, you know, Facebook does not have a monopoly or Meta does not have a monopoly over the metaverse. Right. Uh, you know, and we are one of various organizations that are coming together to build this infrastructure now. And so to be at the forefront of it and include um, artificial intelligence in that mix as well. So the idea is how do we raise the literacy um, in artificial intelligence and extended reality for our peoples? And um, so that's what we're working on right now. And we're really excited about that. Um, so one thing to add to that is that I'm the co-founder and uh, co-director of the Community Future School. It's out of the Museum of Children's Arts in Oakland, California, downtown Oakland, where we're training 11th and 12th, 12th graders to think about the future more intentionally with through teaching them Afrofuturism, about indigenous futurism and queer futurism. And they're creating a manifesto to imagine what Oakland might look like in 2045. Oh, wow, that's and excellent. <laughs> that's excellent. Uh, and it, it's always great to hear because you know we always talk about how can we bring the youth into the conversation? How can we train them up you know, for the future? So that's always great to hear. Now, when people hear all of these things, metaverse, when they hear artificial intelligence and things of that nature, that can be frightening for a lot of people. And Black folk in particular, and I would argue rightfully so, you know, when these new technologies come out and so forth, we're very hesitant because we we envision these ways in which folks can further control or attempt to control us. Uh, you know, because if you're studying the future, if you have these things out uh, that you're a part of, that you're studying, there are folks that don't have our best interests that are part of these same con conversations on the other side, if you will. What is it that you would say to the Black community and individuals that are concerned about artificial intelligence, the metaverse, and things of that nature, as far as it perhaps stripping out humanity, or like I said, being used as an instrument of control over us? Well, I'd say um, that to understand um, that artificial intelligence at this stage is an opportunity and not something to be as feared about. I mean, sure, there are concerns, but like any technology, it can be deployed for both bad and good. And to really, and to understand, like to kind of raise our literacy about it, because at this stage, AI is more of a great pattern recognition device, then um, it doesn't, it can't reason, you know, it doesn't have sentience, but it does need more soul. You know, it does need need more data, um, more understanding of the Black experience. And that's something that we can create. So actually, we can create our own, what they call language learning models. That's the brain of artificial intelligence. And you can feed it data to create your own, what they call LLM, language learning model. And that gives an, an incentive for all communities to create their own language learning model and to train it around the data that reflects their experiences. 
and to help it be like a community advisor, community assistant. So that's where it's really exciting right? because no one necessarily has a lock on what the LLM can be trained to do. And you can adopt, there's cheaper models than what they have out. And maybe they're not as fully you know, advanced, but they can give us an advantage on learning how to do this and raising our participation in it. So, um, you know, I've worked with people in Brazil, um, Zaika and Guillaume, who created the Black Speculative Arts Movement uh, Hub in Sao Paulo. And they're working with AI right now and in extended reality. So I think that as we see these types of opportunities multiplying, that we can have a stake in it and have more agency in it. Because right. that's what we want. Because actually, we have been innovators of the future. Mm -hmm. You know, Grandmaster Flash. Right. You know, partner Ahmed has a great story about that. But Grandmaster Flash created the crossfader, you know, made the music last all night long. And he was an electrician. We have so hundreds of Black uh, inventors and scientists at the cutting edge of technology right. through these 200 years. And so um, we are no strangers to, to tech innovation, you right. know, and I think that's an undiscovered story that people don't understand. Like in Hidden Figures, those women, right. mathematicians, computer scientists, engineers right. who chartered the, the trajectory into space for NASA, right. you know? Right. And that's the thing, like, we, we don't recognize our own greatness and our own contributions to it in many cases uh because when the language changes up you know we look at it differently but as you just pointed out when we look at the things we've actually done the inventions uh the innovations like yeah we have been futurists from the beginning i've oftentimes argued that since the ancient world we've been futurists when you create math when you create architectural uh uh, uh, uh marvels like we've done from the you know throughout the continent that speaks to preparing to and sending messages to the future so i would agree with that 100 percent uh before i move uh forward how can folks find you how can they reach you oh yeah okay so we have a website called afrorhythms.com and that is spelled a-f-r-o-r-i-t-h-m-s.com and it's where we we take the idea of um you know, Afro and combine it with rhythms from algorithms and create Afro rhythms. Because what we're really about is that we are we are in the future and we are in a future that's digital too. And so how can we project and amplify our futures in the future of algorithms? Um, but it's also about, you know, it's gonna be rhythmic too. Right, right. You know, <laughs> have soul. So uh, but how do we heal the af the the algorithm, and that's where the aphorism comes into play. You I see. know, how do we create more aphorisms in the future that represent and amplify our beings, our soul? I see. And how can folks find you directly? Is it through that website, or are there other means? Yeah, that's through that website. Um, I'm also on Instagram um, at Avilani A V I L. O N N Y. Um, and you can also email me at dr, that's doctor, dr. Dot Brooks, B R O O K S, at gmail.com. And that's the principal ways you can find me and reach out to me. Um, happy to have a conversation. Excellent. Excellent. And for someone that is new to this, okay, they're hearing this perhaps for the first time or they've always been curious, what would you recommend in terms of? You mentioned some books and some journals and so forth. What can you give us as like your intro, if you will, into this realm of futuristic studies or Afrofuturistic studies, if they're looking at it from a more academic um, perspective as you do? What would be the, your top books, websites, or even people that you would recommend? Yeah, um, well, definitely Afrofuturism 2.0, The Rise of Astro Blackness, that was co-edited by Ronaldo Anderson. Um, also, um, a kind of part, acad part academic and part journalistic portrayal of Afrofuturism is by Yotasha Womack, um, who also just came out with a really cool book about the Black Panther as a cultural exploration. That's really dope. Um, and we also recently just came out with an article in the Black Journal, which is the leading academic um, journal for Black studies. And we have a special issue on Afrofuturism, 
where um, edited, co-edited by uh, Ronaldo Anderson, uh, where I have an article with my with my Afro Rhythm Group um, team called, um, you know, envisioning Africana futures in 2045. How do we dismantle white foresight to create pluriverse pluri <laughs> pluriverses for all through the lens of Afrofuturism? So that's a really good article that I think it, you know it's the latest of what we're thinking about at the moment. Excellent. Um, excellent. Okay, any other recommendations or that would be a good starter pack, if you will, for folks? That would be good. There was one that just came out last year called The Experience of Black Design. Mm -hmm. And that is amazing um, it, uh, because it, it interviews, has articles by um, black designers across the field of you know Afrofuturism, where um, futures meet design futures too. And it's, it's a fantastic anthology. Um, so you know believe it or not we're actually coming up on the close of uh this segment i wanted to speak further if you can hang around and we can have another uh, episode together i wanted to speak further about this game that you played a role in designing in uh, for uh the players if you will to envision this future uh free of uh racism or combating white supremacy because i think that that is an awesome game because we had uh brother best on some time ago to talk about it and i wanted to get some additional insight from you um before we go uh in a minute or so do you have any final thoughts or final words for our uh listeners well, I'd say, you know, in terms of um, really having agency in the future, remember that you are the signal of the future. Black people have always been signals of the future. We actually anticipate the future. Uh, we have been futurists. Uh, you know, we were talking about freedom and Black spirituals. We've learned how to adapt through apocalyptic times. So we actually the world needs our wisdom and our what I call our ancestral intelligence, the real AI. So remember that you are the real AI. That's excellent. That's an excellent way to end it. So once again, doc, uh, Dr. Brooks, thank you so much for joining us today. And like I said, I'm inviting you to come back for another segment because I'm sure some folks want to hear a continuation uh, of this conversation. Like I said, that game, uh, I want you guys to tune in and listen to it because that, that game is so powerful and so needed. Uh, so that'll do it for another episode of Into the Afroverse with your host, William Jones, and Into the Afroverse, where we're taking Black folks into the future. And once again, people are always asking how they can support um, the show. This show is part of a bigger network, Afrofuturism Network, for which I'm the founder. So please go to afrofuturismnet.com and you can find out how you can support this show and keep it on the air, afrofuturismnet.com. Also, check us out on YouTube, on the Afrofuturism Network if you want to hear some past episodes. And so that'll about do it for us. Folks, you have a good day. Take care of yourselves. And a special shout out to Mr. Duke Productions for producing today's episode. Take care. <laughs>